Hey everybody, I'm Jody Vance. Hey, and I'm George Affleck. And it's time for... A million, 40 million people unspun. Forty-one million. Forty-one million people in Canada. Uh, Congratulations, we did it. You what? know what's wild is that we hit the forty million mark six months ago. Yeah, we're growing, and uh, you know, if, mostly through immigration. We have three hundred to five hundred thousand new immigrants coming to Canada. Uh, that's you know, we're one of the most uh, open countries, Western industrialized countries in the world, unlike America, who's trying to push people back into Mexico mm -hmm. um, as opposed to coming out with better immigration policies, but headaches and problems with immigration and, and, and growth right here. In the, you know, we talk a lot about this on the show. It doesn't come without its headaches growth. No, I mean, as the daughter of an immigrant, I'm going to be very grateful for the immigration programs um, in this country. I love a melting pot. I love the diversity that is our country. Um, what I struggle with, is having not enough infrastructure because I was going to just say housing and then I went no healthcare no wait uh, no wait uh. <laughs> like yeah. there's like where do we even begin with the struggle I mean housing housing is for real that w undeniable piece of this like we don't have enough space to house the people who are currently here, it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yet the doors are open with a promise of a better life for those coming here, migrating here or claiming refugee status from places that are terrible that they're fleeing. Yeah. And they come here and they can't find a place to live. And we still have people fighting on the supply and demand concept, you know, that we don't need to build more housing. You're like, like literally look at the numbers, 500,000 people, 41 million people in Canada. There was a million less a year ago. We're not building that much enough and on all levels of housing, not just, you know, high end social, all the levels of housing need to be all built right. because some of these people who are coming here are wealthy. Some are poor. Some are all, they're all over the map, just like all of us are all over the map. So we need to build all kinds of housing. And then we also have to think about our healthcare system, which was already strained. Uh, there was some good news this last couple of weeks about doctors in BC and that were in fact, they kind of seem to be getting a handle on that because of the changes we made to the pharmacies and to how doctors get paid and all that stuff. So that's good news. Yeah. Uh, you know, that there is some flexibility and we're leading the way as in Canada on that. But, you know, you look at the downtown East side, you look at this OPS, so you look at what's happening in the NIMA, all these things we'll talk about, but there's, there's, there's stuff Let's start, well, hold it's on, all but, about but, growth. With, like it is all about growth and growing in the right way because when we're seeing emergency rooms in the interior of bc or in northern bc regularly closing due to staffing issues and yet more people are moving into those areas because it's more mm. affordable to live there but you can't you, the emergency room can't be an hour and a half drive away like that's that's not realistic that's and not and for <laughs> i think it's rupert i think the Prince Rupert uh, emergency room closed this past weekend for the 10th time in the last number of months. This isn't just like, oh, whoops. It's like, this is, you know, emergencies happen every day, every day. And what would, you know, if you're sitting in your cozy chair, if we're sitting in our cozy spaces right now going, well, we don't have, you know, right now, or I don't have an emergency. emergency. Yeah. But you've, when you you've, you've, need you've, it. you've gone through it with you and your family and yes. if anybody's dealt with the emergency system, it's, you know, minutes make a difference. You know, my dad died of a heart attack. It was, you know, if he'd gotten there, you know, partly his fault, but you know, there were, the system was there for him quickly. Yeah. He lived a bit longer, but not, not long enough, but you know, there, you have that kind of stuff happen. You need it. You want assistance immediately. Yeah. And they're also now, we're closed today. <laughs> what? Right. Sorry. We're closed today it, because the staff is so exhausted, uh, under supported, underpaid. I mean, what are we doing in a world where there are hundreds and hundreds of billionaires and we can't pay nurses and, and, and streamline things for physicians or teachers. We can, we could, we could jump off in so many ways with schools. Where do you put the growing population when we're downsizing schools and not building associated with the, you know, let's go, we, let's go back we, to healthcare we, we real about, quick. You know, one thing we've talked a lot about is trying to tie, take the politics out of decision making on certain aspects, right? On, yeah. on, uh, in, you know, inflationary adjustments to 
things that are required by government to, to provide. You, you should not be making this political, you know, healthcare, you right. know, housing. These things should be tied to the rate of inflation and the growth projections that we know are coming. Schooling. They don't build schools until they see the whites of the kids' eyes in the neighborhood. It's ridiculous. It's you, ridiculous. I, I, my kids didn't have a school in Yaletown, even though that there were kids going, where's their school? Uh, oh, yeah, we're going to build that eventually. What, well, the kids are here. Let's build it. Right. Well, it's kind of like being promised a uh, $10 day child care. I heard $10 a day child care for the first time when I actually had a child who needed <laughs> daycare. And guess yeah. how much my care was when I had to work, you know, outside of regular business hours when I was working at breakfast Probably television. Like it wasn't $10 a, a day. Or, it was $10 or, an hour. Yeah. Oh, $10 yeah, that, an hour to be a single mother. It was almost cost prohibitive yeah. for me to work. And when people are like debating, well, how much is it going to cost to have childcare? How much does it cost to not have nurses mm -hmm. and not to be gender specific, but historically nurses have been predominantly women or mm -hmm. lab techs or, you know, whatever the, the, the doers in the mm -hmm. workforce have often been women. And if you can get more women into the workforce, there is more taxes paid that comes back around to pay for the childcare for more women. I heard, um, I heard on actually the Mike Smith show today, they were discussing $10 a day childcare. And there was a, um, it was, I believe it was Jennifer Whiteside who was on, who is in charge of that file and, and, and was like, listen, you know, no, it wasn't Jennifer Whiteside. Sorry. I, excuse me. I can't remember who it was a woman talking about women and child care, but mm -hmm. really astutely pointed out that the money, the $1.9 billion in the BC government's hands right now allocated for child care is yeah. not being spent because the decision uh. hasn't been made how to best spend it. The money, it's not even a matter of we need to put our hand in the taxpayer's pocket to get the money. We have the money. We're just not doing it because we've been promising it. It's been promised, but we, the British Columbians mm -hmm. have been promised this for, well, at least 14 years because my kid's 16 and I sure could have used that daycare when he was three. We approved so many and they st continue to approve so many daycare spaces in, as part of construction projects, right? Yeah. But nobody wants to operate them because the, nobody can afford them and, and yeah. you can't find staff because you can't pay them enough to do the work. Yeah. This That's is right. the ultimate dilemma, you know, okay, you know, this... I don't know if it's a chicken and egg or catch 22 or whatever we're calling this because, uh, you know, each level of government is trying to do one thing or another, but they're not connecting. And there's a disc, there's this disconnect. In fact, there's units available. They're literally sitting empty in this city of Vancouver, ready for daycares. There's one right on Richard street where I live really? Richards and Helmkin. It's a daycare built for that. We approved at the corner of Helmkin and Richards sitting empty because nobody really? wants to run it. Um, and if you go to Yale in that look in that park, it's, kids everywhere yeah uh, but they, nobody can afford to probably pay the probably pay the the taxes on that space uh as well as finding staff and it's an expensive endeavor and so the ten dollar daycare is sure that's great for us but it's also a challenge right now to find staff uh and train them who want to be doing this and then running a daycare business the liability insurance all this kind of stuff is very very risky business and expensive. and it's difficult yeah. it's difficult you think Especially it's hard being a parent? Try having thirty of them, yeah, every day in an unstructured. I wouldn't want to be my daycare teacher. I'll tell you that. Right. So, um, I will say one more thing because it it kind of ties into daycare. The new building approved for right across from VGH. You're bringing me around on towers. I'm going to say this. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, yes. right. How many hundreds? Almost three hundred episodes in, <laughs> and I I finally get it because I saw the mock-up for this tower across the street from BGH, which has two levels of 24 hour daycare built into the structure, which makes so much sense. Or guess who? Hospital workers, right? 24-7, right? 24-7. Uh, you know, my, I had two sisters, two of my sisters were nurses and uh, had, had kids and it was tough. Shift work is tough when you got kids and they were both single moms. Uh, yeah, my mom, single mom, lab technician, Lionsgate Hospital. She worked shifts at Lionsgate Hospital round the clock. She had to do what she had to do. When someone didn't show up, she couldn't leave. She yeah. had to keep going. And she had two small children at home in a time where daycare wasn't a thing, where living nannies were something that happened in Disney movies. You know, that was a Mary Poppins thing. It didn't actually happen. We lived in a co-op in North Van. Like there, it, 
it's something. And and so I celebrate. Yeah. And I understand now what you were talking about. Because, yeah, I would love to see some gentle density in there and maybe just like a little park <laughs> and whatever. No. We Not need on that location. Up. We need, exactly. I mean, that's, exactly. Broadway is the second biggest dis business district, uh, employment district in the province next yeah. to downtown Vancouver. So, uh, and the fact that we've been, I, my, I'm looking at the window. This is my office on Broadway in Ontario. It's, it's yeah. a two story walk up. I'm paying the taxes of a six story, but it really should be a 40 story on the site. Yeah. Um, because nobody's going to care. Okay. Sure. Some houses up there might, but nobody below is going to care. Uh, you know, why are we delaying on this? If somebody wants to build it um, and put rental housing or just strata, I don't care. Just get some units built, get some other stuff below it, mixed yeah. use. Anyway, so this is, the, but then we have crime and then we have other stuff that we have to do. Well, deal let's with. talk about the op uh, OPS, the overdo overdose prevention site that is now closing in Yale Town, in your yeah. neighborhood. That was a troublesome spot. Yeah, right, um, across, right across from that park and where that daycare should be. Right there, right exactly there. Terrible yeah. location. So it's Terrible moving. Yeah. It's closing. It's too so, small. And it, it, right? it's, a, it's, a, it's in a roaming truck now, driving around. It's ridiculous. Wow. So guess where they parked on their first day? Right in front of that old, the, the same location. <laughs> they parked right in front of the location at Talbot and, and Seymour. And so, so many people complained that they drove around the corner and went down an alley and parked there. <laughs> it's so the drug I addict. mean, I understand you need to reach the people, right? Like the people yeah, that need sure. the help, that want the help, that don't want to use a loan, that want to have a safe s situation. They're, it's not like it's optional for them to use because there is the addiction part. Like I, I have empathy for that. I just struggle with why governments can't figure out how to apply the lessons that we've learned over decades to creating an environment and a resource, you know, that we've seen our friend Sarah Blythe has done on the downtown East side, like pushing a boulder uphill, you know, I've been to the downtown East side, uh, overdose prevention site. Mm -hmm. Um, I've dropped off donations there. I've brought coffee and, and food and sandwiches and whatnot and water on a hot day and socks on a, on a freezing cold day, because they need, these people are our community and they need our help. So that's a really important statement. It shouldn't be up to citizens to try and, and, and band-aid together situations. And it shouldn't just be plunked in a neighborhood across the street from a park, you know, with no supports and it becomes a chop shop out front. Like it's, it, yeah, it, and, and we so shouldn't desperate. be also ghettoizing it in the downtown east side either. Right, right. So, right. you know, we've got that development. We talk about, I've talked a lot about it up in Dunbar. Some yeah. people still complain about it, but it's about, I think it's 16 units up there of core need housing for people who have addictions. There are two units next to me built by church, two church, a church group right yeah. next to my home. Sometimes there's some issues, but generally they're a pretty good neighbor. And if we have a challenge, we just go over and talk to the manager. Like, can you just like get this? They have very strict rules about if you yeah. know, no, no tolerance at all. Um, but it's for people who have had drug addictions or alcohol addictions. One half of it's that the other half is just regular social housing built by a, two of them. They're like, about I would think about 50, 100 units between the two. And yeah. we never have issues with the people that live there. What we have issues is with people who are in these places that are randomly wandering around. You've got a, this, truck driving around now like it like it's a some kind of apocalypto a couple apocalyptical uh ice cream truck you know with its bell here come and get your drug come do your drug ding ling 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 follow the truck and you find and inject your drugs into your arm you know what what is going on they're not distributing drugs like ice no, cream no, but, cones. No, but, just yeah, to be clear for somebody who might have made no, no, that no, this is mis a mistake there it is for safe a injection safe injection vehicle. because the messaging is in, with a tainted drug supply is to not use alone. I know. Because when like you go a, down. Like, yeah, but like an ice cream truck and just like that OPS. I get you. What happens is you. people are hanging around it and they're doing their you. thing and they're doing, as you said, a chop shop. And so yeah. now we've got this roaming truck. It's just get it together. What are we doing yeah. here? And not to mention the fact that, okay, can we admit that the, the drug policies that we have loosened up is not working because we right. don't decriminalization have all this other stuff. The title yeah. of that former mayor's book. This is the answer. I've solved it. Oh it's God. like, ah. Uh, you can't no. do these things. We talk about this so much, Jody, about isolationism of, of policies without you do this and then, you know, oh, you know, whack-a-mole. Okay. Oh, that now this is the problem. Okay. And now, did you hear, did you hear the okay. latest, the latest unintended consequence of decrim is that nurses uh, are 
have been ringing the bell for forever, but now it's gone next level because within the rules, the healthcare guidelines, um, one, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't have it in front of me, but a, a leaked memo of a, a patient using smoking meth in the hospital room Ish. mere minutes after a baby was born, right? And the right for them to do that, the right for them to consume their illicit drugs because they are no longer committing a crime by doing so. So the guidelines have now had to be restated and shifted to make it clear that you're you're allowed to bring a small amount of illicit drugs into the healthcare environment. However, then it had to be listed. You're not allowed to use if there's someone under the age of 19. You're not allowed to use if you're in your in a recovery. You're not allowed to use on a psychiatric. I'm like, am I living in the upside down? <laughs> I mean, if if we haven't already put our healthcare workers through enough, yeah. Now we're now we're telling them that you know what you can't actually say no to that person shooting up in the room while they're recovering from their broken ankle. It's what? insane. What? It's insane what is happening. Uh, I don't. And so yeah, p the solutions have to be you know multi level, multi approach. You can't do with one without the other. You can't. Yeah. Build social housing for people with core need without staffing it with people who can manage that situation. You shouldn't be putting those kind of people in a seniors housing development like down in yeah. uh, down in the, in Olympic Village. You shouldn't be having a safe injection site across from a children's park. You shouldn't be. You Those should no be having a safe though, injection George. site somewhere. How did we get to the place where? Oh, it'll be fine. You know, like right across from that. How many million dollar park that we've you know spent on to make it a great place for kids to meet let's put that right across the street and i'm not talking about being nimby i'm talking about back in the planning piece because you go you know a couple of miles that way and everybody's losing their minds over the um arbutus and eighth development right that social housing the big tower yeah, that was yeah, supposed yeah. to be yeah. eight and then That's it's 14 cool. then yeah. it's 17 then it's whatever and, but it's kitty corner to a like elementary school. Like, yeah, like, well, really? And, and there was no other place in the city to put density that. Density should go there, but maybe not that kind of density. I, no, density, I'm all down. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Don't that, get me wrong. That, I'm, I'm just saying, I understand the NIMBYs are going crazy for their reasons. What makes me crazy is this stuff doesn't happen without 9,000 layers of bureaucracy that <laughs> happened first. Or, you know that unit, that place that where the OPS was in on on Seymour Street, yeah. uh, built by the Wall Group by Wall Peter Wall. He built it for free, the building for free, it's social housing. So yeah. he built, he got extra density at his building at the corner of Drake and Richards. Uh, at, if, but he had to build that building first. But part of that development, and this was done under, during Sam Sullivan's uh, policy that we have, where you had to put in also. Uh, community group uh, space. So uh, originally, because I was there when we approved this building. Yeah. Uh, it was meant to be for the LGBTQ community. They were going to use it as a facility. I forget what exactly it was for, uh, a community facility. And so they were part of the, the process, the public hearing process. They were like, this is going to be great. It's going to be great. Then it got built. And then they found out, oh, my God, our taxes are going to be $5,000 a month. We can't afford, we don't even make $5,000 a month in in revenue. We, we're a nonprofit. We're, we're, I think, you know, it just doesn't make sense. So they declined the space that they were getting. It was free. built for them. It was free, but they couldn't afford the, the city's taxes because the city wouldn't waive the taxes. Why so wouldn't the city waive the taxes? Forever. Why would the city not waive not, the taxes? Not within our policy to do that. And the province actually is really strict about that kind of stuff. You're not allowed to waive taxes. You're, you can only provide grants to pay for the taxes. So you can't waive taxes, but you can. This is a provincial regulation. You have to find other ways to give money to those groups to pay those taxes. And so then the taxpayers are going, wait a minute, how come you're giving 50, a hundred million dollars to right. all these groups suddenly? Well, we're not really, we're just waiving the taxes because we're paying their taxes. Well, well, well wait a minute. It's a hundred million, 50 million, 25 million, whatever it might be. But yeah. You're not really waiving their taxes. No. What would be great you're is you're dipping into the they taxpayers. The yeah. Yeah. You're dipping into the pocket again to create a quote unquote grant, which is more taxes to pay so that 
well, we don't, it's, it's so a, it's much of a what's... portion of the taxation. So it's a minimal amount. Um, yeah. What, but we put the city would have put the the energy into the development of this building to create a space, but no other level of government's come to the table to help out with the other side. And so, right. because you're again, you're not working together on this. You got to put a plan together. Okay, we're going to build housing. Cities, you got to put the density together. Province, you got to build the building. Federal government, and you you know you got to you, or you got to build you know province, you got to pay the taxes. Federal government, right. you got to build the building. Whatever, you got to work together and and share the pain across. All of the 41 million people that live in Canada. 41 million. Only Way to bring it around, George people. Affleck. I know. Way to bring it around. I want a, a little bit of breaking news that I didn't get a chance to tell you about when we were sitting down because we basically just hit record today because we had so much to talk about. Yes. I was going back and forth with Sarah Daniels, my fabulous friend and colleague for many years, my former roommate. Uh, you remember her from television, television oh, yeah. and radio. Sarah Daniels is now a realtor and has been for quite some time. She's fantastic. She's my realtor. Full disclosure. Love her. Um, <laughs> last night we were going Sarah back. Sarah Daniels. And, <laughs> yes. Um, eye in the sky. Um, she was texting with me last night. She's going to be on Steel and Vance tonight because she's just discovered with all of this housing stuff and with the wanting to free up rental, because there's all these announcements on, right. You can't do the rent evictions. You have to, now you have to, this is just in the last week. You'll, you'll have to register in order to get rid of your tenant for, to move in a family member or to renovate because th then they're going to track how many times you do it. And then they're yeah. going to, they're going to do some independent checks to make sure that is your mother-in-law who's moved into your suite or whatever. And I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. But Sarah was giving me, did you know that in all of these new rules that the 55 plus the loosening in the 55 plus community, the new rules include only one person who lives there needs to be over the age of 55. Oh, so you, you could have your 32 year old girlfriend. Sorry, Amanda, this is just hypothetical. But you could have your 32 you year old girlfriend from? and you and your your two year old and your soon to be infant child move into that 55 plus plus community. Huh? Interesting. Now. Yeah. She's like, it's I don't know why everybody's not talking about it. It's an absolute nightmare. There used to be a sort of a 15 to 20 percent saving on 55 plus community purchases right. because yeah. they were I, restrictive. I, yeah. And because those restrictions have lifted, now it's like, boom, let's go. She's like, this is going to have incredible um, these uh, negative of, consequences. These, these kinds of policies, that whether they're stick policies or whether or they're, yeah. you know, these bureaucratic twists of you know whatever how about you just put all your energy into finding a way to build more stop what you've been saying stuff that for exists. five years stop that it. it didn't work they did the whole empty homes tax in vancouver how many more mm -hmm. is is it cheaper for my kid to live in vancouver now no he's living yeah. in a basement suite in kits for twenty five hundred dollars a month i mean give Crazy. me a break it made no difference all those units that were just sold and yeah. the others if they're loaded they're just paying the tax they don't care yeah. They're loaded. They don't care. Okay, sure. Five thousand dollars a year, whatever. Yeah, five percent. I don't care. Then then fifty thousand. Sure. I, I live offshore. I don't care. So right. you didn't solve. You spent thirty million dollars a year on a tax that brings in fifteen million. It's just like it's crazy. And it doesn't actually. You know do what else problem. is crazy? We could sit here and talk about housing the whole time because we're five hundred plus episodes into this podcast and five hundred. Sorry, five <laughs> years into <laughs> two hundred, two hundred and seventy episodes. Right, two hundred and sixty. Whatever. Two fifty today, right? 250 there, is 250. Is it two fifty today? I think okay. we're two fiftieth today. Yeah. So we're safely five years. Yeah. This Six is our years. fifth year. Two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. When did we start? Two thousand eight. Yeah, we started. But we started January before 2000. the pandemic. January crazy 2000. times um but we've consistently talked about housing affordability the crisis the overdose crisis the public health emergency like mm -hmm. all of these things are feeling like a broken record but we keep <laughs> talking about them because if we stop talking about them it's just going to continue to be as crappy as it currently is i'm really worried over these just last five years we'll call it how much things have changed when it comes to um, personal safety, uh, mm -hmm. witnessing people like openly stealing things, openly committing crimes, crimes right in front of our eyes. There used to be a time, and you said this about patios and Granville Entertainment District, I think on our first ever podcast was like eyeballs on the street, feet on the ground, community looking out for one another. We've lost the plot. Mm -hmm. 
if you build buildings that have no say entrances for example off the street you have a real problem and 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 if you you know walls and things like that like my building has retail on the bottom and then it's townhouses that whole yale town original yale town concept was tower yeah. point tower retail and and residential open out to the street so the people are coming in and out they're walking around uh it's great but then they changed it they made they got rid of the the, the that concept and uh and then they brought in a lot of this stuff that we talked about earlier uh and you see Yale Town decline in in real time you can just see it i mean it's only a matter of time you know neighborhoods can change really quickly and people often mock Yale Town as oh hoity toity and all the yuppies and all that stuff but man oh man i as a resident and owner there i worry about a neighborhood going into decline very quickly because people start yeah. talking like i'm right now uh how bad things are and this is not the way uh, a growing uh, province and city should be going. We should be able to manage this. A, a great example is the West End, where for ever we've had many different kinds of people living there happily. Yeah. Seniors, poor, rich, uh, you know, new immigrants, kids, families, uh, every ethnic group, you know, the LGBTQ, like endless of different kinds of community living in harmony for the last 60 years in the West End. Why would we want to break that? And then we seem to be doing that everywhere now. We get these, build these communities and then we break them because we push in stuff and break break the quotient out. And it's not about NIMBY. It's about just to get, yeah. look at the balance. Look at the balance. And every neighborhood has to have the balance. Everybody's got to share the wealth and the pain. Uh, I used to go down... I used to go down to Yale Town all the time. I used to go down the West End all the time. I used to go downtown all the time. I used to go down, but granted, before all of Robson became high-end spaces, like I just don't shop in, you know, the highest 1% of fashion outlets. Um, but I used to go down there to buy spices. I used to go down there to shop shop. Oh, and yes. I used to Robson's be able Strasse. to, what's that? Robson Strasse. Robson Strasse, thank you very much. And, uh, yes, yeah. we'd go down. My grandma and I would go down there to get her special senna tea and her chamomile. Um, you know, back in the day, when there was not a parking meter, and then there was timed parking, and then there were parking meters, and then there were parking meters that cost a little bit more. And I've recently gone down there and went, oh, look, I got a meter. I, I'm not going to valet park at Joe Forte's where I'm going for lunch today. <laughs> Ooh, how special. And I went to the meter and I put in two hours, $18. <laughs> really? For a meter. God. Come on now. Are you, uh, are you the, serious? It's one of the, it's one of the that, box. I'm not, ones, right? The ones that I, are in the box now that you put on? That you, yeah, yeah. I'm not doing they, it anymore. Change. I'm not. And then the going down. Yeah. Going down to the West End. I just want to go down Davy Street. Oh, no, it's between our this and that. So I can't turn there. Okay, I can't turn anywhere. Okay, now I have to go all the way down to Georgia Street and come back up Denman to get to date. I'm not going to Davy Street because I can't come down Beach Avenue either because I can So you know what? Forget it. I'm we don't gonna, want you downtown anyway. We don't want you there. But it used, but it used to be a place that you could go to as yeah. a resident. It's not like I'm coming in from somewhere and causing a big problem in my plug-in hybrid. I'm just not going anymore because it used to be I can dash downtown in 15 minutes. It's a 45 minute turnaround from kits. You park at the, uh, the old post office, which is now uh was it an IGA or whatever it is? Blah blahs. Blah blah blahs. Blah blah blah. Uh, lots of parking there. <laughs> lots of parking. Oh my god. On the top can we just floor. tuck in? We've we got no time. We we've just talked it all through. Geez. Um, <laughs> but there's one thing that happened today oh, yes. breaking news, the policing yes. change. That was what we were gonna focus on, actually. I know. Whoops. <laughs> yeah interesting the province made some changes to the police act is that and and it just seems it's a really amendments long, you read the press release to me before because i came straight from a meeting and it literally is like a bunch of blah 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 blah, blah. but the core of it seems to be a punishment to brenda lock <laughs> yes we're taking your so, control away <laughs> yeah that's that's basically the the takeaway from it is that um the the board will get to the board of any quote unquote any municipality, Surrey, uh, will be able Vancouver. to. Sorry, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not talking to my phone. Sorry, <laughs> Surrey, not Siri. Go away, Siri. Oh, right, of course. Stop it. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Um, right okay. now, the mayor is automatically, and any municipality is automatically the chair of the police board. So Brenda Locke has been blocking 
everything for Surrey Police Services, even when the provincial government's like, no, we're doing it. So, and she's like, no, I won't. I won't approve the budget. I won't do the thing. So now the province is saying, among a whole bunch of other garbly goop in this press release, basically, we're changing the police act, or yes, the to reflect um, Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General, new legislation paves the way for police reform is what they're calling it. And it sounds like it potentially elected potential board as well. It sounds like they're heading towards some kind of like they have in the United States where they everybody, everybody right. gets elected, um, right. not appointed by the mayor and by a bunch of politicians. So suggested by two special committees over the last five years. So we've we've studied it. It's always great to get a special committee to keep doing special committees till you get the answer you want. Right. That's Correct. Cool. Legislation will strengthen oversight of municipal police with several changes, including allowing the police complaint commissioner to call a public hearing earlier in misconduct investigations and providing the police complaint commissioner authority to conduct systemic reviews and investigations into the causes and contributors of police complaints. I do think that's refreshing. That's mm -hmm. one thing that they kind of slipped in there because there is right now there's a lot of protection. Yeah set up there's a lot of good stuff in that thing for sure so it's very convoluted and, yeah. and there's a few things that you read out and like so you know we'll hear more about it but that, that to yeah. me I, that what it was like they're hiding the main bury the lead as they say in journalism yeah. right uh yes. which was brendan Locke, you've been a very naughty mayor we're going to have to punish you you've been put on notice you're, you're going to be out of the board you're off but the i board. don't i do believe and i'm not 100 percent on this because nothing's 100 percent. but i do believe if it was put to a vote by the police board in surrey right now she would not be elected chair. There's <laughs> frustration there. Well, I think Surrey is going to be the main interest for the next provincial election, as I've always predicted, yeah. uh, it's where the NDP will potentially win or lose a minority majority government and, and potentially could lead to a coalition between the BC United and the Conservative Party to control the province, because that's where it's potentially heading if uh, the polling keeps going the way it's going. I don't think those two are going to work together. Well, they might have to if they if they could combine forces and create their own minority government. But once they're, once they're, they're in. We'll see. You're often right. Only time will tell. I did that. Only thing. time will she tell. Hates, she hates when people say that. She's like, oh, God, enough. Okay, <laughs> bye. Bye.